to fortunate and I feel it a great honor and a privilege to introduce our uh, speaker. As Jeff mentioned, as we met as a committee, we felt uh, uh, we we brainstormed as who could we get that would uh, best uh, inform us as to what we could do with financial planning and inflation and so forth. And and I mentioned, why don't we get Howard Ruff? And they said, well, you'll never find him. Uh, and he's a busy man. The first phone call I made was. Uh, to California. They informed me that he was in Germany. A couple of days later I called back. He was then in Hawaii. A couple of days later in Alaska. And I uh, finally uh, uh, tracked down his personal secretary and she was very gracious in uh, scheduling him for this presentation. Uh, he's a well-known author, lecturer, uh, radio and, and television personality. He's uh, a author and publisher of the Rough Times with a circulation of over 200,000. Uh, many of you are familiar with one of his books. Uh, it, it is the biggest selling financial book in history. It was, it's called uh, How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years. And I was telling him earlier my only regrets concerning that book uh, were that I didn't follow its advice uh, more strictly. His newest book is uh, How to Survive and Win in the Inflationary 80s. Uh, he's in great demand as a, a speaker and a lecturer, and, and we're really to, happy to have him here. Let me just tell you briefly about his background. He was uh, born and raised in California. He uh, uh, is now a resident of Utah, and we're proud to have him here and be part of Utah. Uh, his radio show, he tells me, is, is on over 200 stations throughout the world. He uh, just recently, uh, well, let me tell you about uh, some of the committees and so forth that he's uh, put together and shared. In March 1980, Mr. Ruff uh, enlarged his interest by also entering the political arena as chairman of the Free the Eagle Committee, a national lobbying organization he founded which is dedicated to the support and free enterprise legislation. During the 80 election campaign, he also chaired the Rough Pack, a political action committee which supported 36 congressional candidate, candidates espousing the free enterprise economic principles. Uh, I'm really honored to uh, uh, introduce uh, to you Mr. Howard Ruff. This group seems to have divided itself into a left wing and a right wing. Uh, I just want you to know that I represent the radical middle. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, and it was especially a great pleasure to run into an old friend of mine. We're friends for years and work together in the same company. I employed him for a number of years, and that's Wendell Jones, a member of your faculty. That's been just was wonderful to see Wendell. Uh, I understand that Glenn Tuckett told you a whole bunch of funny sports stories a little while ago, but there is a story that I has been traced back to Glenn Tuckett that apropos of nothing whatsoever that I'm going to say to you, I ought to pass on to you that I don't think you've heard, and it's a golf story. It seems, are there any golfers in the room? Well, my partner, Terry Jeffers, is a wonderful golfer. He's a super golfer, and but I, but... Uh, I don't play golf with Terry anymore. Would you play golf with somebody who breaks his clubs and swears in the presence of women, grinds your ball into the green with his heel and cheats on his score? Neither will Terry. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, this story uh, that I was going to tell you, it seems that there was a fellow who belonged to a golf club who was uh, a wonderful golfer. He could hit the ball a country mile. He could outdrive anybody in the club, but he was 83 years old and his eyesight was going and he couldn't find it after he hit it. So he was talking to the club pro about his problem, and the pro said, well, I've got just a golfing partner for you. He's 93, and he doesn't hit the ball very well anymore, but he's got eyes like an eagle. You two ought to make a great pair. So they teamed up, instantly liked each other, got out on the course, and our friend teed off and hit the ball a country mile, and he turned to his friend. He said, did you see where it went? He says, I sure did, but I forget. Uh, <clears throat> Now, 
Now a story that's a little more apropos of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I turn down most speaking engagements, except those that I think are important to the community in which I live and those that will pay me a hellacious sum of money, uh, some which have been placed high enough to discourage most requests. But there was a time when I would speak anywhere. That was before anybody had heard of me, and it was part of our public relations effort to be known. So wherever two or three were gathered together, there I was. <laughs> and it seems that uh, we had a, uh, a lecture at a place called Grass Valley, California. And I lived down in Modesto at the time, and, and this was an economics club. So I got in my diesel rabbit, and I drove up through Sacramento and hit Interstate 80, which I'm sure most of you know is the main route between San Francisco, Reno, and Salt Lake. And as I started heading up the Sierra Nevada mountains just this side of Roseville, and the incline started up, I found myself behind a great big truck. Now, you all know Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it will. In this case, we saw in practice Ruff's corollary to Murphy's Law in that Murphy was an optimist. Not only was I behind the truck, they had narrowed the road down to one lane because of construction and the truck had mechanical problems. So he struggled up the hill, eventually got down to about five miles an hour and I was right behind him, he was belching diesel smoke all over me and finally managed to find a turn off, pulled off the side of the road, I pulled up behind to try to help him. Just as I got out of the car, I noticed the truck driver had gotten out of the truck was striding very purposefully back in my direction. He was about 6'3", he was about this thick through both ways, and he was swinging a baseball bat, taking practice swings. Well, anybody who has ever read anything I have to, uh, that I've written knows that one of the guiding principles of my life is personal survival. So I dove back in my car, fumbled for my key, just got things started, and I realized he hadn't even seen me. He was heading for the back of his truck, and he went around the back of his truck and proceeded to pound on it with his baseball bat. It was all covered with dents, the paint was chipped off, and it was obvious that this was a repeat performance. It had happened before. All of a sudden, he turned around and sprinted for the cab. Sprinted! Jumped in, started off, and took off, literally peeling rubber like a scalded cat, and took off up the hill like nothing was wrong. And it took me about a mile, two miles to catch him. Finally, on the next hill, the same thing happened. He pulled off. I watched from a safe distance this time. Finally, he went past my turnoff, but I had to see if he was going to do it again. And I was late for my lecture, but I didn't care. So I followed him, and he pulled off. This time, I got my courage up. My curiosity overcame my cowardice, and I grabbed him by the arm as he got out of the truck. I said, just a minute. I want to know what you're doing. I've seen you do this twice before. I've got to know. He says, it's none of your business, buddy. Well... I was just too curious to back down. I'd gone this far, and I, so I said, well, no, I've got to know. I'll follow you to Reno if I have to, but I'm going to find out. He says, you promise you won't laugh? I looked up at him. I said, I promise I won't laugh. He said, well, it's really pretty simple. I'm on my way to Reno with a truckload of chickens. It's a 10-ton truck. I've got 15 tons of chickens. If I can't keep a third of them flying, we're not going to make it up this hill. <laughs> And there goes my credibility. <laughs> but the truck driver taught a very important lesson that I think is absolutely uh, appropriate and apropos of the financial times we're living in. I assume that most of you are at least trying, if not succeeding, to set aside little savings, try to get a little bit of investment money aside. Maybe you've accumulated an equity in a house and you're trying to figure out how to unlock it and use that to somehow beat the financial game. The only trouble is, you like the truck driver, just sitting there and pushing on the accelerator isn't going to do the job because inflation has changed all the rules. It isn't working. And so when something doesn't work, you've got to try something else. It doesn't matter how strange it looks, how unusual it is. The only criterion for deciding what to do with your money is, does it work? And that's the truck driver lesson. And I'm here to tell you that not only do most of the traditional conservative things that people have been doing, the American middle class have been doing for years, for decades, centuries, almost, seems like two centuries, those things don't work anymore. Why? Because they have been attacked by a neutron bomb. Inflation is the neutron bomb of the financial world. The principle behind a neutron bomb is that the blast doesn't destroy the buildings, leaves them standing, it just kills the people. Inflation leaves the bank account intact, but destroys the purchasing power. If you have 15% inflation rate, as we had in 1980, and you're earning 5.5% in a passbook account, 
or eight or nine percent in a CD you bought a couple of years ago, and your money's losing purchasing power at the rate of 15.5% a year, 8.5% return doesn't exactly replace it. And what's more, the government, preserving the fiction, the fiction that you have actually made money, taxes you on the interest as though you had a genuine profit when you did not. And what's happening is that your purchasing power is being confiscated. But it's a secret to most people because the numbers don't change. At $10,000 in a CD, you still got $10,000 in a CD plus the accumulated interest. And it looks like you're growing. But unfortunately, the faster you go, the behinder you get. And it's not working. And the inflationary environment, that we're in the beginning stages of the kind of inflationary environment that in every major inflation in history has devastated the future and the hopes of the middle class who trusted their government. And there is no exception to that. None. Now, as a financial advisor, that's when I have my financial advisor hat on because I wear a lot of hats, my only objective is to be right about the future because if I'm wrong about the future, I'm going to make terrible mistakes with my client's money and because I always follow my own advice, I'm going to blow some bucks myself. So I have to be right. When I have on my prophet of doom hat, which is the one you, most people, if you read the press about me, would think I wear all the time, my job there is to point out the worst case situation that can materialize if we don't change things. And because that's a very unpleasant sort of thing, it's not a very popular sort of thing to talk about, and so it's gotten me beat up pretty good in the press. I've been called a prophet of doom. I don't know how many times I've read that. I'm sick of it. Uh, but nevertheless, if our present trends continue and enough of the middle class have their savings devastated by inflation, it's not going to be a very pretty picture as to the kind of world you're going to live in and your children and your grandchildren are going to grow up in. Unless something happens to change it. And the big question of the day, as a financial advisor in trying to guide people to what they should do with their hard-earned savings, is to get that future scenario right. Are we going to have more inflation, or is Reagan going to get it under control? Is the Fed going to hold on to these high interest rates too long and break the back of the economy and give us an actual deflationary depression? Or are we going to make the soft landing that the Reagan administration has forecast or implied? Are we going to have a runaway inflation like Germany? What's going to happen? Because if you get that wrong, then you'll make the wrong decision with your money. For example, if you're going to have stable times or deflation, the best possible thing you could do is put your money into a bank account, a government-insured, FDIC-insured bank account. That's the best thing you can do, because that money will increase in purchasing power as prices fall. And so you'll have a net increase in purchasing power. If, however, we're going to have continued inflation, and especially if we're going to have more in the future than we've had in the past, that's the dumbest thing you could do. You ought to own gold and silver and land and diamonds and baseball cards and stamps and coins, the things that do incredibly well during inflations. However, if you're going to have the deflation or stability, all of those things are money losers. So I'm going to give you my scenario and forecast and give you some advice. If I'm right about the scenario, the advice will be wonderful and you'll all make money. If I'm wrong about the scenario, you'll have trouble finding me. <laughs> it's really what it boils down to. So you're going to have to decide today whether or not you think I'm right. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the future as I see it and why, and trying to make my case. I have no vested interest in being optimistic or pessimistic. I'm trying to be a realist. I want to see the world as it really is. I'm only concerned in a search for truth, with the exception, of course, of my truck driver story. Now, in that search for truth, let me tell you what I have concluded and, and why about the future. I yield to no one in enthusiastic support and admiration for Ronald Reagan and what he is doing. I raised a million and a half dollars to help elect the man. Uh, he is doing what I expected him to do. He's keeping his promises. He's a man of immense courage and great integrity, great personal security, a sense of personal security about him. Uh, he's an outstanding executive. He knows how to pick good people and give them their general guidelines and let them figure out how to get from here to there, which is the, uh, which is the, the mark of an outstanding executive. He delegates beautifully. He's everything you would want in a president. 
Now the question is, however, can he get done what has to be done when he has to deal with a Congress that is reflecting what the people want? That's the question. The president proposes, but Congress disposes. Never forget that. Now, there's no question he has taken an abrupt turn in another direction. I mean, we used to be looking that way down the road, more social programs, more, more growing of, uh, uh, of stimulating the economy through uh, deficits, et cetera, et cetera. He's turned and he says, no, that's the wrong direction now. That direction leads to an abyss we don't want to fall into. Let's go this way. So what happens, though, is we're still going that way, but at least he's dragging his feet. He hasn't given us a tax cut. All we got was a reduction in the rate at which your taxes will increase. That's all it is. It's true. Uh, that means that you'll still get escalated into higher tax brackets as you get your cost of living increases, as inadequate as they might appear to be. And you will be in higher tax brackets, pay higher percentages, not as big a percentage as you would have paid under Jimmy Carter. You'll pay a lot less taxes than you would if Jimmy Carter had been reelected, but you will pay more under Reagan than you did in the last year of the Carter administration. There's the Social Security tax, which is leaping upward. The windfall profits tax you pay at the gas pump. A lot of concealed and hidden taxes. The total tax take will grow. Did he cut government spending? No, he didn't. All he did was reduce the Carter proposal for the 1982 fiscal year to a smaller rate of increase. Nothing was really cut. And people are screaming that his over $650 billion budget is inadequate when we were told only a couple of years ago a $500 million budget was wonderful. Isn't that awesome that in two or three years we'd add more to the federal budget than we spent in the first century of the country's history? That's exactly what's happening. Now, the question is, Will he be able, with the things he has done and the things that he will be able to do in the future, will he be able to get inflation under control? The answer is unequivocally no. And I'd like to explain to you why. First, I think we better define inflation. And once you get this definition straight, I think a lot of your personal financial decisions will be a lot easier to make. If you think of inflation as high, higher prices and think of an investment as something that you just increase, or you try to get something that, that goes up faster than the rate of inflation, you may make some bad decisions because inflation is not, raising, or not uh, increasing prices. Inflation is shrinking money. An old farmer friend of mine down in Mapleton where I live told me that inflation is watering the milk is diluting the value of the existing money by putting more money into the system, spending it into circulation. Now, inflation is no more rising prices than hurricanes could be properly named falling trees. They are the consequence of inflation, the rational response on the part of business and labor to keep prices and wages ahead of the dilution of the value of the money. Roman Empire had the same problem. Uh, there's, it, it's an incredible story. Their inflation took 100 years to develop because they didn't have a printing press to shorten the process. But they uh, did some pretty fascinating things. One emperor decided that he needed the support of the people because he was having trouble with the Senate. So he announced they would feed the poor of Rome. Now when you announce you're going to do something like that, the word tends to get around. And so the poor of the empire started flocking into Rome. Then they found out to house them. They were cluttering up the streets, so they built the first high-rise walk-up tenements in history. And then the rich and the middle class said, there goes the neighborhood, so they moved across the Tiber River and built suburbs, complete with uh, fences and security guards. And they were able to finance this by bringing in the wealth of captured nations, and then there weren't any cap nations to capture, so they managed to pull off one pretty good deal where they simply accused the owner of uh, Spain's biggest silver mines of trees and executed him and took over his mines because money then was gold and silver coins. And they, when that wasn't working anymore, they decided to dilute the money by adding some base metals to the coins. And then they, did, they diluted a little more, and they made them smaller. And they cut holes in the middle of them and beveled the edges and anything they could do to get more mileage out of it. But people figured that out, and they said, hey, this coin is 10% brass, I want 10% more coins for my goods and services. And as inflation took over and eventually they developed a psychology of getting rid of the money as fast as you can before it goes down in value, turn it into something of real value, 
The uh, Roman legions abroad uh, and all over the empire began hearing of the hardships their families were suffering because of inflation. They did not have labor unions to get their, uh, co their contracts indexed. So some of them started deserting, and pretty soon desertions had ex exceeded enlistments. And, the and then they tried wage and price controls, and they found they couldn't control wage and prices without controlling every other aspect of people's lives. And a perfectly well-intended emperor came up with the most all-pervasive dictatorship the world has ever seen. There's been nothing like it, ever. And eventually, Rome was defeated when the barbarians burst into Rome, and they defeated, they were, the Roman legions were defeated by an inferior invading military force that they would have swept away 50 years ago because their ranks and their morale was so decimated by inflation. And it came as a great shock to the middle class and the rich. They just thought, this can't happen here. This is Rome. Things like that just don't happen in Rome. They didn't believe it. And a dark age ensued that lasted for over a thousand years. Now, are there any, do you see any parallels there? I mean, great Scott, they even had the Colosseum, you know, it started out with the gladiator fights and ended up with one of the last events, a pitched naval battle that they fought in there where 600 slaves died tied to their oars. That's the equivalent of Monday night at Howard Cosell, I guess. But I mean, they entertained them, they fed them, they housed them, and those people became dependent on government. And Rome became like a black hole in space, not soaking up energy, but soaking up the wealth of the empire, which disappeared to no avail and was gone forever and brought down the empire. Same thing's happening with the large cities of this society today. We're pouring money into that hole in space to no avail, accomplishing nothing. The problems are worse than they were before, but it's draining the wealth of the countryside. And we see many parallels here, but the end result is inflation. We're watering the milk. We're creating money. Now, why are we creating money and how do we do it? Well, it is the conventional wisdom that all of our inflation is the fault of government deficits. That simply is not true. Government deficits, contrib deficits contribute to about a third of the problem. It is true that deficit spending is the cause of inflation, but government is only about one third of that problem because deficit spending is carried on in every segment of our society, cities, states, corporations, and the consumer, especially the consumer. And our whole system is designed to encourage them to continue to be a deficit spender. Now, let me tell you how money is created. Most people think it's just printed in Washington. Well, they print it. Let me tell you, they do print it. I was at the Bureau of Printing and Engraving three weeks ago for an hour, and they printed $30 million while I was there. That paper, and you look at it, it's just paper. It just goes in worthless paper and ink, and it comes out money, backed by nothing except the willingness of somebody to accept it in return for giving up something of value. That's all, strictly psychology. But, the psych but apparently, the confidence has shrunk by about 15% because that's how much more people want in return for their goods and services now compared to a little over a year ago. So the collapse of the currency that people talk about is a book called The Coming Currency Collapse. That's not a coming event, that's a process that's going on right now. And its definition is inflation. It's not an event, it's an ongoing process. So now, they do print money, no question about that, and it's pretty simple. The government wants to float a $2 billion bond issue. They call the Fed. The Fed says, we'll buy it. Uh, the government says, fine. Uh, the Fed creates a, a, a deposit out of nothing, the Federal Reserve Banks, for the government, and then it goes to the Treasury Department, which authorizes the Bureau of Printing and Engraving to print the money that they give to the Fed to loan back to the government on which they charge interest. So the Fed can buy the notes and bills and bonds. Now, if that sounds complicated, don't blame me, because that's the way it is. Money is created out of nothing, and then it is spent into circulation by government. But that's only a third of the problem. How is most of the money created? Well, most of the money is created through the banking system and is made out of nothing. Only about 7% of the money in circulation is actually printed, minted, or coined. The rest of it is simply bookkeeping entries at banks. Now, I'll tell you how that works. I'll give you an oversimplified example. The reason I give oversimplified examples is because I am not a classically trained economist. I majored in music education, and if it isn't oversimplified, I can't understand it. So I assume that you can't either, so I'll oversimplify it for you. Okay, fair enough. I didn't minor in economics, and I do know a little something about the subject, but uh, nevertheless, I, I don't want to talk to you in abstruse terms that are only for the purpose of impressing the already uh, qualified. Let's say that I started a bank today, the Howard Ruff National Bank, and you come flocking into my bank, 
friend, okay? You, you, you will come swarming into my bank wanting to deposit money, okay? You come in and you deposit $1,000 in my bank, all right? How much money do you have? Got $1,000 in the bank. Wendell, where are you? Wendell, you come into my bank to borrow some money. I know you. You'd probably be borrowing my money. So Wendell comes into my bank to borrow some money. Now, under present law, I would be, be required to put 15% of that $1,000 or $150 in a non-interest bearing account at the Federal Reserve Bank, just in case 15% of my clients ever wanted their money back. So Wendell comes in, and I have $850 available to loan him, and it just so happens that's how much he wants to borrow. So, Wendell, I'm going to loan you $850. You're going to walk out with your bills in your hand. Okay, how much money do you have? $850. How much money do you have? Got $1,000 in the bank. There's now $1,850 in circulation. Did I print anything? Just a deposit slip and a computer entry. However, Wendell, rather than taking your money out, why don't you open an account with us and we'll deposit your money to your account, okay? All right? So now he deposits his $850 in my account. I now have another $850 to use as reserves to loan against. I'll put a 15% of that in the Federal Reserve Bank and loan the rest to somebody else. So I created money out of nothing and then used it as a deposit and reserves against which I could create some more money. And so the money multiplies like hamsters throughout our society. Now the Fed can control the rate at which money is created to some degree and control the money supply in several ways. One of the ways they do it is by raising or lowering that 15% reserve requirement. It used to be they couldn't lower it below 15%, a rather prudent thing to keep the banks safe and liquid. Would you all agree it would be a good idea they keep 15% around just in case? Front runs on the banks? Well, now, last year, there, there was an interesting law passed by the Congress called the Monetary Control Act of 1980. And in that act, the Fed fought for it, tooth and nail, and it never hit the press. There was not one thing on any of the wire services. I know, because I have all the wire services. And it's only people like myself in the newsletter industry who blew the whistle on this. The Fed fought tooth and nail for and got the right to reduce bank reserve requirements to zero if necessary so they could stimulate the economy if the, if the need arose. So while they were fighting tooth and nail supposedly as our saviors against inflation, they were yelling whoa at the inflationary horse, they were sharpening their spurs. They not only did that, but they did another thing. They also got the right to change, and, the, and it went through just like that, a, a technical change in the language of the laws which govern this sort of thing. Up until now, the Fed could only print money with government securities as collateral. If they were going to print money, the government had to issue bonds, notes, and bills. And you knew they were adding to the national debt, and it was a rather straightforward, relatively honest process. They got the right to change the definition of collateral to any security, not just government securities. That means that they could buy and, and actually propose. They floated a trial balloon through Business Week after they got this power. They could buy a billion-dollar stock issue from Chrysler in order to save it with newly printed money. And your money would then not be backed by government securities, but by Chrysler stock. How does that make you feel? They also have specific power now to buy foreign securities, which means that if Brazil, which owes over $50 billion to the New York banks, should get in trouble, and they are in trouble, and say we are going to default, we can't make our interest payments, the Federal Reserve could and would buy a couple of three billion dollars worth of Brazilian bonds with newly printed money, and then they could send that newly printed money back to make sure they're up to date on their loans so the New York banks don't have to write them off. They have that power. And such proposals are floating around right now. Now, money, then, is created by raising, or the, the rate at which we create money is by raising or lowering the percentage of reserves. It's also, there are also some other ways, but that's enough for purposes of our illustration. Now, they create money, then, through this system to accommodate whom? The federal government, because we did not have the guts to tax ourselves for what we wanted to spend. And we decided to tax our children and grandchildren instead. Float a 25-year-old treasury bond. Who are you taxing? You're taxing my grandchildren. I've got two grandchildren, two more on the way. And when I held my first one about a year and a half ago, I guess it was because he was born on April 15th. But, <laughs> but when I held Ryan Lawrence Ruff for the first time, I looked at the kid and I said, Great Scott, he's only two days old and he's $3,000 in debt. It's a share of the national debt. 
That's worse than original sin. By the time he reaches the workforce, he's old enough to work, he'll be over $20 million in debt at the present rate of growth of the national debt and assuming a modest inflation rate. That's awesome, isn't it? Now, someday Ryan will study the Constitution, assuming, of course, he goes to a private school. And <clears throat> I think this was the wrong audience to say that to him. A few people nodding agreement there. You were nodding agreement, right? Okay. What are you, a reactionary or something? <laughs> anyway, he will study the Constitution, and he'll find out that, that uh, taxation without representation was supposed to be unconstitutional, and yet we taxed him. So we dump the debt off on him and throw that burden of debt to the next generation. Now, that's immoral, if nothing else. Now, as we create the money, however, and the, the, the government wants to spend more than it takes in, also cities and states want to do that too. And corporations found, find that it is very advantageous for them to borrow and pay back with cheap dollars. Maybe they'll get away with paying back worthless dollars if there's enough inflation. Because inflation benefits a lot of people. It benefits the borrowers who borrow the money to make money with, and then they pay back with cheap dollars. The Germans, in the late stages of their inflation, some of them were paying off their mortgages with a half an hour's wages. Isn't that awesome to think about? Half hour's wages. In fact, the German government paid off all of its bonds to all of its people. His whole national debt in late 1923 with Deutschmarks that had the total purchasing power of one American penny because the numbers on the contract didn't change, you see. If they were printing the smallest denomination coin, trillion Deutschmarks printed on only one side to save ink, and you were uh, being paid two or three times a day and throwing your money literally out the window to your wife who would wait outside to get it so she could rush off and spend it before it was devalued further. It's the kind of environment they were in. And so inflation benefits borrowers. So there's a very large constituency out there of homeowners, a lot of people who owe a lot of money, who'd love to pay back in cheap dollars, and the biggest single borrower of all is the federal government, then comes uh, cities and states, then comes American corporations, then comes the consumer. As Pogo said, we have met the enemy and he is us. We go through conversations in our homes that go something like this. Well, see, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who want to save up in advance and pay cash for everything. And then there are those who want to buy it now before the price goes up. And those two kinds of people tend to marry each other. <laughs> and, they have, and they have this kind of conversation in their home. Uh, Husband says, boy, you know I've wanted that fishing boat. Yeah, I see a lot of heads nodding there, uh-huh. Uh, this is almost all women over, it's almost all men over there. Why is this? What's going on? Uh, I notice that the women are on my right and the men on my left. I don't know if that means anything. The, the conversation goes something like this. I don't want, uh, I want to buy that boat, honey. Well, why don't we save up for it? Well, as price is going up faster than we can save. Besides, I understand prices are going up 18% next week. That's what the salesman told me. We can still get in on the deal. And besides, the interest is tax deductible. And we need the tax shelter. <laughs> so, the, finally the wife gets overruled and he buys the boat. Now, the government would like you to do that, you see, because if you don't, buy that boat, 1.3 factory boat workers will probably lose their jobs. And you probably would like it because maybe some of the people you're training would have jobs at that factory. There's all kinds of reasons for everybody wanting that boat to be bought. And in fact, that's so institutionalized that if people stop going into debt to buy hard uh, consumer goods like that, it shows up as a negative economic indicator. So it's institutionalized in our system. So the money is literally created out of nothing through the banking system the way I described, and all consumer debt is inflationary, just as inflationary as the same number of dollars in the federal debt. All right, everybody understand now how inflation is created and where it comes from? So everybody's against inflation. Uh, we voted for a president who promised to end it. That's the fourth one, incidentally. And we voted for senators and congressmen who voted to end it, who voted to cut government spending. We are all in favor of cutting government spending in the aggregate. But just about all of us have some program that we are not, that we'd rather have them leave there in particular. Because your benefits from government are inflationary and mine are merely social justice. 
Now, in this process, unfortunately, here's what happens. You decide to go out there and cut. We're going to at least get government's end of it under control, and we're going to cut things. And you look, the president looks and says, well, what are the areas that have grown the most with the biggest numbers? Because you can't look at the smallest numbers and get big cuts. You have to look at the biggest numbers. They're the social programs, the poor. So if he goes to work to cut the budget, he is immediately accused of being heartless. If he uh, and proposes a tax system that would encourage investment and reward investment, why? The people that have the most money to invest are the rich, so he is now Robin Hood in reverse. And the rhetoric, which has been socialist and communist rhetoric from the beginning of those movements, is, ah, we are benefiting the rich at the expense of the poor. Not realizing that if the rich don't invest, if the upper middle class and the middle class don't get the rewards for risking their money and allowed to keep some of it, there won't be any jobs for the poor, for those who want them. Because the growth of jobs in our society has never come from big companies getting bigger. It has come from small companies getting into business, from entrepreneurs who believe they can become sincerely rich, who believe they can invest and they can get rich someday. So they start businesses and they grow and they explode and, and a few of them really start expanding. They are the ones that provide the jobs. And without those people, and without that American dream that you can get rich and keep it, you have stricken the heart and guts out of the capitalist free enterprise system. And who are the first to suffer? The poor. Because they become dependent upon government who can only pay them in money which will be shrinking in value faster they can, than they can increase the benefits. And the system depends upon rewarding those who are bright and venturesome and courageous. Now, let me ask a modest question. The Germans and the Japanese have bigger deficits than we do as a percentage of, the na of, their, uh, of their budgets and of their gross national product. And yet they have less than half our inflation rate. Doesn't that kind of shoot down my theory a little bit? Why? How do they get away with it? Pretty simple. The Germans save 16.5% of their income. Savers. The Japanese save 19.5%. When our government wants to borrow money, uh, it can't find any money out there to borrow. It has to create new money to borrow because we only save 5.5% of our income, and so they have to print new money. When the Germans and Japanese want to borrow, the savers have replenished the pool, or the pool out there by increasing the pool of savings, and they can go out and borrow without having to print any money. Voila, deficits and no inflation. Our system actually fines people for doing the things that would save us and rewards them for doing rewards us for doing the things that got us in trouble. If we want people to invest and save, don't we? You invest successfully, you get fined. It's called the capital gains tax. The Germans and the Japanese don't have one. If your company makes it and starts paying out profits, we call it dividends, we tax them twice. Once at the corporate level, and again at the highest rate reserved in our society to punish people financially for succeeding at 70% until this recent tax bill, as high as 70% of dividends. Germans don't tax dividends, neither do the Japanese. If you put your money in a bank or savings and loan, so there's plenty of money at reasonable prices for mortgages so you can buy a home, tax rate was as high as 70% until this new tax bill. And it's still, for a lot of people, in the 20, 30, 40% range. The Germans and the Japanese do not tax savings from interest. Then on top of that, remember when you go out and buy that boat, the interest is tax deductible. Uncle Sam rewards you with a tax benefit for increasing the debt and increasing the inflation as a result. Germans and the Japanese don't do that. You go into debt, pay the interest, you're on your own. It is not tax deductible. If we wanted to have the same result, let's do the same things they're doing. Might have to give it a little extra kick. For a year or two, you might have to come up with some kind of investment tax credit for some percentage of the money that you put in a bank or savings and loan to encourage people to do it because it's a losing proposition mathematically. Now you have to get sweeten it a bit. I wouldn't be ob object to that. If we got these other proposals, I'd like to see them give a tax credit of 10%, actual credit against the bottom line taxes of 10% of the money that goes into a long-term CD. The problem then that we face is that we are doing all of the things that lead to inflation and we are not directly attacking the problem. We are continuing to encourage it while trying to fight it. And I think that's foolish. The Reagan program is a step in the right direction, but it is a three-foot leap across a ten-foot ditch. 
Now let me tell you a couple of things that absolutely guarantee that it will not get inflation under control. In the first place, it doesn't address the problem of the consumer at all. Second place, it uh, does not really seriously address yet the one problem that's going to absolutely bury us in printed money, and that's Social Security. Social Security system, according to the government's statement of financial liabilities, they publish every two years, and their, in their footnotes has a present deficit of around $3.5 trillion. That's the difference between the money that will be collected and the money that will be paid out over the lifetime of the people in the program now. Now, three and a half trillion dollars, I, f I figured that it's actually closer to seven trillion dollars because there's some very low inflation assumptions there. That's roughly equal to the value of everything that everyone in America owns. It's over three times, three to seven times, the total money supply. And it will be funded by the printing press. You think they're going to cut Social Security? No way! When President Reagan when asked to bite the bullet on Social Security, chose to not even nibble the bullet, but to lick the bullet, and proposed just kind of taking a little look at the corners of it with a modest, mild proposal to just kind of postpone some things, our conservative, Republican-controlled, Reagan-dominated Senate sent the President a resolution on Social Security that said, in effect, cool it. And the vote for the resolution was 96 to nothing. A margin of vote that is usually reserved for a declaration of Mother's Day. <laughs> as long as you're not talking about excessive motherhood, which is politically unpopular today. Franklin D. Roosevelt, when he declared war in Japan after Pearl Harbor, only got a vote of 95 to 1. Now what this means is that they're not going to tackle that problem and it's going to swamp us in printed money. Consequently, my advice to my clients is the same as Will Rogers' advice. Invest in inflation, it's the only thing that's going up. Now the problem is that sometimes you get into a confused period like now when the inflation rate is down, it's down to a solid 9%. We think that's wonderful. Remember when we were so scared by 4.5% inflation that, Ronald Reagan, uh, that uh, Richard Nixon gave us wage and price controls? But now we think 9% is wonderful compared to what it used to be. It was as high as 18, 19% a year ago. But now it's down in that range. And a lot of people have stopped worrying so much about inflation. Inflation might take 10% out of their purchasing power, but unemployment would take 100% of it. So they're much more worried about jobs than they are about inflation. And so the shift of emphasis on the part of the population is changing. But I have told my people that in this environment, keep your eye on the ball. Inflation will come back and the next round will be higher. The next round of inflation will be in the 25 to 30% range. The next round of interest rates will be in the 40% range. Between now and then, however, we're going to have much lower inflation rates, or much lower interest rates, excuse me, and a very deep recession. We are in the early stages of a deep recession. We are now sliding over into it. It will be very deep and very scary. But the, the Federal Reserve is prepared to inflate us out of it. And don't you forget that I told you this, despite all the rhetoric about how they're going to persist, with a group of newsletter writers, which is a bunch of prickly iconoclasts like me, you can look that up when you get home. Uh, we sat down with one of the governors of the Federal Reserve Board, and he thought he was just going to have to give us the usual PR statement, but he was dealing with a bunch of guys that knew the, understood the system. We asked him some point-blank questions. Are you prepared to keep these interest rates high until they break the back of the economy, even risking a deflationary depression like the 30s, because that would be the consequences of it? His answer was, no, of course not. We wouldn't do that, but we're a long way from that. Their testimony, a secret testimony before the Oversight Committee of the House that oversees the Federal Reserve, a member of whom was with us, according to him, was that they think they're right on the brink, they're right on the, on the abyss, and they can't hold out much longer. So they'll have to let the interest rates go and they'll have to start to stimulate. That's good news and bad news, of course. Now, we asked him uh, whether or not he would use his powers under the Monetary Control Act of 1980. You know what his answer was? What powers? But then a, an aide went up and whispered in his ear at some length, and then he became a, suddenly an instant expert. I walked away from the Federal Reserve, the great and powerful Federal Reserve. You know, I was awestruck when we walked into the boardroom, the most powerful room in the world. I immediately rushed to the head of the table. That's, that's, the, that's the only job I want in government. I want, I'd like to be head chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Don't hold your breath till that happens. 
Uh, I would consider myself to have been elected president of the Titanic and I'd steer it into the biggest iceberg I could find because I happen to think that uh, Federal Reserve is at the root of many of our problems. But I sat there feeling a sense of power about that room when I walked in. And when I walked out, I felt like I did when I had first seen the movie The Wizard of Oz. And we learned toward the end of the movie that the great and powerful wizard was a frightened old man hiding behind a curtain, frantically pulling levers, trying to figure out how to get Dorothy back to Kansas. They don't know what they are doing. And the information on which they make their week by week and month by month decisions on the money supply is inaccurate and totally undependable. A figure that hits the headlines, money supply up one and a half percent. Six months later, it can be revised, money supply down three-tenths of one percent. Inaccurate figures reported because of a clerical error at the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank. That literally happened. And that th sort of thing happens. Of course, the correction ends up on page 31 of the Wall Street Journal. Doesn't even make the press. Which, I'm a pilot. That is sort of be like flying an airplane in instrument weather with instruments that could not be considered accurate until I'd been on the ground for three hours. That's literally how they're flying. And any pilot knows that a lot of these clouds around here have rocks in them. And you've got to know where you're going. And the Federal Reserve is flying in clouds with rocks in them, financial rocks. And they're acting on bad data, but they simply don't know what to do. Well, as a result, I expect the one thing they do know how to do well is inflate. They have inflated whenever we looked like we were in danger. recession sliding into a depression they've inflated every time and their catch uh, all the word expression to justify that has been we can inflate we can run uh, deficits and relax the money supply without any inflationary consequences because there is slack in the economy I've been warning my subscribers to look for that for over a year now and it finally popped up in the Wall Street Journal three days ago with a prestigious economist from the Wharton School of Economics saying there is slack in the economy. Sort of like going water skiing, starting 10 feet behind the rope with all the rope piled in the water and saying, hit it, there's slack in the rope. <laughs> Won't hurt you for a little while. But when the slack is gone, it'll jerk your arms off. And that's precisely what I think we're headed for. Now, I hope I persuaded you that we have an inflationary environment. Now let me look at the other side of the coin. There's a chance they might miscalculate. And I assign about a 30% probability to it. They might have hung on too long because the effect of the high interest rates aren't felt for months later. There's a big lag here. And they could hang on too long. They could break the back of the economy. They could thrust us into a deflationary depression. It's not likely. And they wouldn't do it on purpose. But they might do it by accident. I asked specifically of this board governor, could you defy the White House if they wanted lower interest rates and looser money? He said, yes, we could defy the White House. We're independent. Could you defy the Congress? Well, that's another story. We operate under the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, established by Congress, and they could rewrite that. So we have to listen. And Congress is now starting to howl about the high interest rates. Now, that's good news. The rates will come down. You can buy a home. You can refinance. Everything will look good for a while as, if, as the economy goes from fever to chills. That's not necessarily good news. Chills do not necessarily mean you are getting healthy. But there's no question that it would benefit some of us if we take advantage of it at a time like this. And I'm going to tell you how to take advantage of it. So with my odds being 70% in favor of a runaway inflation later and 30% in favor of a miscalculation that brings us to a deflationary depression, what should you do with your money? That's the $64 question. And I'll let you know when I figure it out. Uh, well, never having been accused of being lacking, of lacking for an opinion, I shall give you mine. I'd like to tell you what I think you ought to do with your money. First, bet 70% of your money on long-term inflation, taking advantage of the fact that the, in, the classic inflation hedges are all depressed in price from their highs. Trouble with markets is that when, when the markets are down and everybody ought to be buying them, that's when everybody is most afraid of them for fear they might go lower or they won't go up. But that is precisely the time you should buy. Baron Rothschild gave us the best investment advice of anyone in history, and he proved it by getting rich. He said, buy when the blood is running in the streets. The blood is running in the streets, has, has been running in the streets in the gold market, 
silver market and the bond market. Buy, buy, buy. Now, the classic inflation hedges are gold. There's lots of ways to buy gold. You can go to a coin dealer and buy Krugerrands or Canadian maple leaves if you're hung up on South Africa and want to buy their Krugerrands. Buy Canadian maple leaves or Austrian hundred coronas or Mexican gold pesos. They all sell for the value of the gold in them if they were melted down, and plus a little premium, and the premium you get back when you sell the coins. Uh, buy silver. It's better buy than gold. If you had three dollars to put into precious metals, I'd buy two dollars worth of silver for every dollar worth of gold because silver has dropped far further in relation to, to gold. Uh, they both come down, but silver has dropped further percentage-wise. Makes it a better buy. I would like to buy bonds, but I consider that as part of my bet on the other side, that 30 percent hedge, because I'm not absolutely positive it's going to be inflation. I want to hedge a bit. I'll buy some bonds. Now, the way that works is if you have a deep depression, bonds can be bought now at discounts of, up to, of, of close to 40 percent. You can buy a United States government bond worth $1,000 face value for, for $600. Did you know that? You can do that? Most people don't understand that. See, what happens, there are bonds out there issued four or five years ago. Maybe those bonds are paying uh, 6%. Buy a $1,000 bond back then, you'd be getting $60 a year in interest. That interest does not change with interest rates. You're locked in. That's your interest rate. But today, you can buy U.S. government bonds yielding 14 or 15 percent. So who's going to pay you $1,000 for your uh, $60 yielding bond when you could get one yielding $140 or $150? Obviously, your $1,000 bond would sell at a big discount, and it does in the marketplace because interest rates went up. When interest rates come back down, bond prices will soar. Now, if you have a full-scale depression, those bonds will be, the, especially the government bonds, will be the recipient of investors looking for safety. They'll rush into them and they'll bid them up to incredible prices, even above their par value. In the depression of the 30s, interest rates dropped to as low as 1.5%, and bonds were bid up to prices way above the redemption value by the marketplace, placing a high premium on safety, figuring if the government's bonds weren't any good, there was nothing. Now, then we're back into a new stone age and no investment would be any good. Now, with that being the case, there are tremendous capital gain possibilities. And if it turns out I'm wrong about inflation, that they do break the back of the economy, we'll go into a deflationary depression. Inflation is dead forever. I lose money on my gold and my silver and my real estate, but I will make a fortune on bonds and I will offset it. And my, the net effect will be the retention of my purchasing power. However, there's another kicker here on these bonds. If you buy bonds and we merely have a recession with falling interest rates, followed by an inflation, I'll still make a bundle on my bonds. I'll just sell them out when it looks like inflation is about to turn. Hang on to my inflation hedges and make money on the inflation hedges too. So, so you're protecting yourself both ways. So bonds are the key. How do you buy bonds? Well, the best way is to buy shares of a bond fund. There are, you can go to any broker and say, give me a list of bond funds listed on the New York Stock Exchange. These are companies that simply buy bonds. They buy all the bonds, and you, in effect, own bonds by owning shares of the fund. If bond prices rise, the value of the stock goes up, and you can call your broker and sell it. You could pretty well get a list of all the bond funds and line them up on the wall and throw darts at them and not make any mistakes, because when interest rates come down, all bond prices will rise, and interest rates are going to plummet. The rally in the bonds has begun. The decline in the interest rates, in my opinion, has begun. It may, it may uh, give us one more shakeout, but I rather doubt it. Consequently, that's a good hedge both ways. Though your long-term hedge is going to be gold, you can buy it in the form of Kruger Rands, as I said, or you can buy it in the form of uh, certificates from Merrill Lynch through their share builder program. You can buy as small as $100 worth at a time. They give you a certificate for a given amount of gold held in a warehouse in Delaware. And you can just buy or sell that with a call to your broker or say, sell my gold and put me into bonds or whatever, whatever the environment is right. Or even into your money market fund, uh, which would give you high yield while you're waiting and figuring out what to do with your money. Uh, you can buy gold in, this, in the form of gold shares, the shares of gold mining companies like Homestake Mining in, in this country or the South African mining companies. Or if you want to keep it simple, you buy the shares of ASA a company listed on the New York Stock Exchange, which invests in gold mining shares. And as gold rises and the potential profits of the gold mines rise, so do the value of the shares, and ASA will do very well. Uh, you can buy gold futures. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm also suffering from hay fever in this state. I, did, I think I'm going to go on a lecture tour every September and October. But you can buy, uh, there's so many ways to do it, and the little investor can do it. You can buy small gold coins for as little as $150. You can buy a roll of dimes for as little as $40 or $50, silver dimes. 
Uh, you can buy you could buy a round lot of shares of some of these bond funds for eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars. You don't have to be rich to do these things. And I think it's more important to if you're not rich. I assume you're not rich, you wouldn't be teaching here. Uh, the the rich guy could, I mean, if you had $10 million, I could lose $5 million in, in investing and still be reasonably happy with $5 million left over. But if you have a couple of three or $5,000 and you lose half of it, it is a calamity for you. So you have to make sure that you retain your purchasing power. Remember the, root, the, the neutron bomb concept. Your money has to grow faster than the rate of inflation after and taxes are chewing it up. Any other course of action will destroy you. I'll give you a forecast. We will see $2,000 to $3,000 an ounce gold in this decade. That's the second half of a forecast I made 14 months ago when I said we will see $2,000 to $3,000 an ounce gold in this decade, but we will see $400 on the way there. And we saw it a couple of months ago. I called it, and we, when it went below 400 to 388 I yelled at my clients every way I could get to them and said, throw caution to the winds, buy gold. You will see $100 an ounce silver in this decade. $100 an ounce silver. Right now it's trading somewhere around 10 or 10 and a half. A lot of people are worried because the government announced silver stockpile sales. Don't worry about that. Gold went from $160 an ounce to $850 an ounce in the face of regular government gold auctions. The market can absorb that with no difficulty at all. Bonds, everybody's terrified of them. A lot of companies, insurance companies, that buy them for their investment portfolios have sworn on a stack of Bibles they'll never buy another bond as long as they live. The sentiment is bearish for them. And it's just when everybody thinks it's a lousy buy is when you ought to jump in. Now, you can carry this contrary thinking too far. For example, I'm sure there were some great bargains in uh, Saigon real estate the day before Vietnam fell. You have to make sure you've got the, wrong, the, the, the long-term trend figured right. But that's what I hope I've done for you today. Bet on inflation. Now, after you've done all these nice things with your money, you might consider also, incidentally, what do you do with the money that you have to keep liquid for the orderly conduct of your affairs or that you've got parked while you're trying to figure out what to do with it? Buy shares of a money market fund. That's not a money market certificate at the bank or the savings and loan. It's a money market mutual fund. There was a big fight in this state a few months back over the money market between the money market funds and the banks. Remember, it just was making the papers all along in the last few days of the legislative session. The bankers wanted the money market funds crippled because they were so attractive to people like you that money was leaving the banks going into them. So they said, hey, let's handicap those guys. Well, because that was to the detriment of the consumer and a violation of free market principles, I got involved in the fight. I addressed the legislature. I was the last speaker before the vote. It had gone through the Senate 21 to 3. It had gone through the, it was, looked like it was going to go through 40 to 35. And we managed to switch four votes at the last minute and beat that bill. 39-36. Surprised the heck out of everybody. But the reason for that is it was a violation of a free market principle. People had figured out that if you had to park your money somewhere, that the bank only gave you the choice between a 5.5% passbook account if you wanted liquidity where you could take it any time you wanted, or a high yield where you had to tie up for six months to two years and take a big penalty if you needed it. And the money market fund gave you the high yield and the perfect liquidity. So a money market fund represents safety in so much as now liquidity and safety are synonymous. Being able to move rapidly. This is a crazy upside-down cake of a world. Markets move so rapidly today Things are happening so fast. Trying to beat these markets is like trying to play leapfrog with a unicorn. I mean, one slip and you're in bad trouble. <laughs> and so liquidity, being able to move rapidly, has an awful lot of merit today. Uh, it's terribly important that we, that we maintain our liquidity. If you don't maintain liquidity, and if you do not invest to beat inflation over the long haul, soon you will be sliding down the razor blade of life, as Tom Lehrer put it in one of his recordings. My feeling, my friends, is that uh, we're facing volatile and difficult times, but you can prosper during them. There has never been a set of financial circumstances in which you cannot benefit. And I've been called a pessimist. Hey, look, anybody that can look at what I see ahead and say, hey, there's ways we can make this work for us has got to be an optimist. And I am. I think we can beat the game. But I also would like to suggest that if you concentrate strictly on your own well-being and you do not recognize that you also have a responsibility to try to bring about change by being politically active, both in lobbying and the elections, by working for people, 
I look at two candidates and I don't try to find out whether he agrees with everything I agree with before I vote for him. I say, is this man's instinctive reaction to turn to government for a program to solve our problem or does he trust the free market? If he trusts the free market and the free enterprise system, more so than his opponent, I'll vote for him. I don't care what his party label is. So we've got to get actively involved. We do it with our lobbying organization, which we invite you to, to help us with and support. It's called Free the Eagle. We have made a difference. We made the difference in the money market fund battle, a free market issue in this state and in four other states. We've made the difference in several important legislative things in Congress where we ferreted out what was happening and rallied forces behind us and brought about change. So you have to do that too. So now, because I am worried about the kind of world my grandchildren are going to inherit, I've spent about 40% of my time on non-revenue producing activities. One of the things I'm trying to do is educate people. That's why I accepted this lecture for free. I get paid $10,000 to go places to speak, and I turn down 50 of those a year. So why did I come here? Because you're teachers, and you mold people's attitudes. Now, you're not all teaching economics, but I have found that if teachers can understand what these fundamentals are, they can have an immense influence on the young, because the ignorance of this younger generation in economic matters is abysmal. When we were preparing a promotional film for the Howard Ruff Educational Foundation, we went to a high school here in Salt Lake, considered the top economics class in the city, with a brilliant teacher. And we asked those kids questions, bright seniors, things like, what is the Federal Reserve? Well, one student said, the Federal Reserve is the cash the government has put aside for a rainy day. <laughs> it's been pouring for years. Another one said, the Federal Reserve is the gold we have back of our money. The teacher still does not believe us. We haven't had any gold back of our money since 1971, and only partially then between then and 1933. But the best answer came from a student who said, the Federal Reserve is the citizen army we can call on in time of war. <laughs> We asked what was the gross national product, and the only answer that was volunteered by anybody was the gross national product was all the garbage and pollution produced by our society. <laughs> it sounded gross to her. <laughs> Literally, that's the kind of stuff we get. The ignorance is abysmal. Now, you as, as teachers, as those who influence young minds, need to understand some sound principles. It's utterly fascinating to me that those who are on the anti-free enterprise side of the issue, who are contributing to the problem, have been immensely influenced and directed by the teachers of this country. Did you know that in the Democratic National Convention, which kind of represents a, a, a philosophy collectively that's kind of the opposite of what I've told you about today, which I think you would agree with, 60% uh, of the delegates to that convention were public employees, and 40% of them were teachers. Now, how many were on the free enterprise side of the fence? Hardly any. You have a responsibility to know and understand how this system works because how the next generation votes, how the next generation acts may determine whether we have a free enterprise system. And let me tell you one thing, and this is a, a, a gut-wrenching fact. History records not one single example of a free society without a capitalist free enterprise system. All other attempts to improve everyone's lot without capitalism, free enterprise, and people keeping and gaining the rewards of their efforts has resulted in dictatorship of the left or the right. There's not one single example. Another sobering statistic. History does not record one single example of a society getting rid of its inflation through an act of self-discipline. It always happens either through dictatorship or through an orgy of printing press money or in a collapse of the monetary system. Can this nation survive such a thing? Only God knows. We've proven we can, do, we can uh, survive a deflationary depression. That's why I'd cause one if I were president. It would take the inflationary excesses out of our society. I'd be called the Hoover of the 80s and they'd run against me for the next 50 years. But I do it because I would take the excesses out of it. It would break the back of inflation because we've demonstrated our system can survive a depression. 
But we have not yet been tested as to whether or not we can survive an inflation that run its, runs its course, because inflations bring down systems. Out of the great inflations of Germany, France, and China came uh, Hitler, Napoleon, and Mao Zedong. You name me a society that's had an inflation that ran its course, it ended up free. You can't do it. That's why, while forecasting inflation, while investing in it, I am working like hell to try to prevent its consequences with all of our political and lobbying and educational activities. Because if you took my advice and you got rich, it would all turn to ashes in your hands if we lost our freedom and our markets. So this is a gut issue of great significance. My children, my grandchildren are very important to me. Incidentally, a couple of people commented on the fact that I am bearded for the first time. Those who see me have never seen me with a beard on. It's only two and a half weeks old, so don't uh, be kind to it. It is still young. But uh, after five or six years trying to become the sex symbol of the hard money financial movement, I, without success, I decided to go for father image patriarch. Uh, because it's coming in uh, uh, what I think is an immensely attractive shade of gray. But, uh, but I just want you to tell you that uh, my role as father, husband, and grandfather is far more important to me than my role as financial advisor. And I grew up in a wonderful world where I could make choices. But I'll tell you this, if we lose the capitalist free enterprise system and if the forces who are opposed to it are in ascendancy and gain the kind of control they would like, I will be among the first to be lined up against the wall for the things I've stated, the things I've said. So this to me is a battle for survival in a very real and very visceral sense. I will tell you the free enterprise system is threatened, the Constitution of the United States is in danger of hanging by a thread, and it will be inflation that is a great threat, and it will materialize in the 80s. In the meantime, you want yourselves and the next generation to enhance your assets, to take your stewardship, to make it multiply, to do the best you can, and then pass it on to the next generation to give them something to offset the debt you also passed on to them. We have a moral responsibility to do nothing less than that. Thanks so much for having uh, me with you. I've enjoyed it immensely. God bless you all. Jim, after that forecast, I don't know if you want to give your lecture this afternoon or not. Maybe we just all ought to go home. Really appreciate Mr. Ruff being here. And uh, we'll take about a 10 or 15 minute break and be back and get into the financial planning portion of this video. Mr. Wheeler got a uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Utah and taught in the Salt Lake School District, taught math for a couple of years. Then went down to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, got a master's degree in international business from the America Institute of International Business. He's presently a certified uh, financial planner. He works with individuals and companies, consulting them on investment programs. He's an associate professor of finance at the University of Utah and is presently a consultant at Foster Marshall, Mr. Wheeler. My friends didn't believe me when they told me I was going to be the main liner and, and Howard Ruff was going to get you all ready for me. <laughs> I think uh, we're going to give you some real practical information in the next hour, an hour and a half or so. Uh, in fact, I think uh, uh, the least of you will walk out of here with some ideas that will be worth several hundred dollars to you. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is move a little bit. I'm going to use an overhead projector and nothing would be worse than not be able to see what I'm going to show you on the screen. And secondly, I'm not going to use the microphone. So if you in the, over on this end would like to move in the middle a little bit, I'm going to be standing right here most of the time. And if those in the back, uh, good luck if you don't want to move down. 